In this video, we're going to continue looking at cosets. One thing you might have observed in some of the previous examples is that every element, given H a subgroup of G, every element lies in some coset of H, namely itself, and more importantly, that somehow, if you view G as a bag of stuff, and you view H as some sort of subset like this, it turns out the cosets partition the, sub, the group into layers. And that's basically one of the primary results we're going to focus on is this fact, which leads into studying equivalence relations. So we're going to view cosets from the point of view of an equivalence relation and use that to prove that every element belongs to a unique coset and the set of all cosets with respect to a subgroup partitions the larger group. So one question you might ask that we've seen based on the calculations we've been dealing with, given a subgroup and given of G and two elements in G, is X on the coset generated by Y? And are they the same coset or do they generate the same coset? So in terms of my analogy with parallel lines, this is similar to asking, is x on the line going through y that's parallel to h? Or the second question is, are they the same line? Of course, you immediately look at that and say, these are actually the same question, aren't they? And yes, it turns out they are the same question. And it will turn out that at the level of cosets for abstract algebra, these questions also have the same answer. And so here is the theorem about cosets. The following are equivalent. Your two cosets are the same. The corresponding right cosets when you switch with inverses are the same. One coset is a subset of the other. One element is the element of the other coset. Or G1 inverse G times G2 is an element in H. This theorem will answer our questions. Our question were these two. It turns out they do have the same answer. And both these answers are actually equivalent to the answer to this last question. So two points lie on the same line, parallel line, if and only if x inverse y lies on the original line. That's the geometric statement. For arbitrary subgroups and cosets, this is the corresponding statement. Your cosets are the same or equal if and only if x inverse y is in your subgroup. This is something we will prove in an upcoming video. But first I will actually just do an example. We'll let h be the, we're going to look at the alternating group on four elements. So even permutations of four symbols. We'll let h be the cyclic subgroup of order three. And we'll ask ourselves, is this permutation in this coset? Well, based on that last result, all we have to check is whether or not this element inverse times this element is in A4. If that's true, then the answer to this question is yes. Well, the inverse of the three cycle is this element. You can rewrite this three cycle as two, four times one, two. You can cross off the one twos and look, it's a product of two, two cycles. So it is an A4. So yes, this two cycle is an element of this coset. And we determine that without actually having to calculate this coset, which is kind of nice. There's a typo there, that should just be one, two, four. So this theorem can allow you to figure out membership and cosets without actually having to exhaustively list all of the elements. So going back to the bigger picture, why do we care about these cosets in the first place? And in light of that previous questions we were just asking, one fact about R squared, once you've got one line, is that R squared is partitioned into 
parallel lines. In other words, every point lies on some line that's parallel to the original one you start with. And so you can partition the whole set into a bunch of a union of lines. The same thing ends up being true about G. When you have a subgroup of H, all the elements of G can be grouped together into the different cosets. And that's one of the reasons we care about cosets. They give us a way to group elements in G together and say that, well, let's classify them by which coset they go to. So now you could say, well, okay, these two students aren't athletes, but hey, they both are an academic decathlon. So X minus Y is an athlete, so to speak. Recall, of course, from the geometry point of view that two elements are on the same parallel line if and only if their difference is on the original line. So I probably should draw the original line here. Of course, if I'm talking about set partitions, I'm really talking about equivalence relations. So I have already used the word relate enough that this should be clear that this is the direction we are headed. But if not, plot twist, I want to talk about equivalence relations. I find this to be somewhat a natural way to explain some of this, these results about cosets. Given a subgroup H, you can define an equivalence relation on G as follows. Two elements are related. G prime is related to G if and only if G inverse G prime is in H. Order matters here. The thing on the right is inverted and put on the left in this product. The claim is that this is an equivalence relation. And then the second part of the claim is that the equivalence classes are the cosets. How do you show something is an equivalence relation? Well, you show that it's reflexive. That means every element is related to itself. So G must be related to G. That's what you want to show. Which means that you want to show that G inverse times G is an H. Well, G inverse G is the identity element. So let's do that. We show it's reflexive. Take an element in G. Since G inverse G is the identity and H is a subgroup, the identity is an H. Thus, this product is an H. And thus, by definition of our relation, G is related to itself. All right, next we want to show that our relation is symmetric. So that means that we're going to assume that we get two elements that are related to each other. And then we want to show the opposite relationship. So since G is related to G prime, that means according to this definition, G prime inverse G is an H. What do we need? We need G inverse G prime to be an H. Well, how do we get there? How are these two related? Well, one is the inverse of the other. So since H is a subgroup, it's closed under inversion. So the inverse of this product is an H. The inverse of the product is the product of the inverses in reverse order. Double inversion is the identity. And so you end up getting this element as an element in H. And thus, G prime is related to G. So if you assume two elements are related, one way they're related in the reverse direction too. Therefore, you're symmetric. Finally, we need to show our relation is transitive. So finally, since we have three elements, I'm not going to use double prime because that's just too ugly. Let's call them A and B and B and C. Suppose A is related to B, which means B inverse A is an H. And suppose B is related to C, which means C inverse B is an H. What do we need? We need C inverse A to be an H. Well, let's just see what happens when we multiply these two things together. All by associativity, we can move one of the parentheses over and move it over again. We've got inverses, so BB inverse is the identity. Identity times A is just A, and look, we have C inverse A. 
H is a subgroup, so it's closed under multiplication. So this product is an element in H because these two individual factors were elements in H. And since this product is equal to C inverse A, that tells us C inverse A is also an H. So by definition of our relation, A is related to C. And so we got our three different parts to be an equivalence relation, and we notice all three of them corresponded to one of the parts of being a subgroup. Uh, reflexivity correspond to the identity, symmetry correspond to the inverse, and transitivity correspond to closure under multiplication. All right, the next part of the claim is with respect to that equivalence relation, the equivalence class of G is the coset. So let G prime be in this equivalence class. By definition, that means that G prime is related to G, which means by definition of our relationship, G inverse G prime is an H, which means that G, prime, G inverse G prime is equal to little h for some little h in our subgroup. Move the little g over and we see that g prime is of the form little g times little h. Well that's the definition of our coset. So we see g prime is an element in our coset. So we see every element in our equivalence class is in the coset. Conversely, take an element in the coset. By definition of the coset, that means that our element here is of the form little g times little h. It has to be able to factor as g times an element in h. Do the same trick we just did, just in reverse order. Multiply uh, both sides on the left by g inverse. g inverse g is equal to h. That means that g inverse g is an element of our subgroup, which means that g prime is related to g, which means that g prime is in the equivalence class. Ergo, we got the other inclusion. So another way to view cosets is as an equivalence class with respect to this equivalence relation. Now finally, I'm ready to prove this, the following our equivalent statement. This was a statement, we have H as a subgroup of a group G. G1 and G2 are arbitrary elements of G, and there's this following equivalent, means that once one of these statements are true, they're all true. Once one of them is false, they're all false. Well, my approach to proving this results is to use the equivalence relation we defined and to use the fact that with respect to that equivalence relation, the equivalence class of G is the coset. So under that interpretation, this first equation identity is saying that these are the same equivalence class. This third one is saying that one equivalence class is contained in another. The fourth one is saying that G2 is an element of the equivalence class of G1, and five is just saying G1 and G2 are related. If you go back to the section on equivalence relations, you'll see that this is true for any equivalence relation. Ergo, statements 1, 3, 4, and 5 have nothing to do with group theory. They're just statements about equivalence classes in general. So the only one that has to do with group theory is 1 and 2. I don't remember how many years I taught modern algebra before I realized this connection and then I realized it's worth making this connection because we make you learn these details about equivalence relations and then oftentimes they make you learn this proof separately and it's the exact same argument. So I might as well draw, connect the dots and say it's the same argument. So there's still one more thing that I have to check. It's this thing about this right coset instead. I'm only going to give a brief proof sketch. The brief proof sketch is that there's actually a second equivalence relation I could have defined, which, where I put the H on the left here. I say G prime is related to G if instead I put the inverse on the right with respect to the right element here. So I replace the order 
from what I had before. You go through the proof, you discover all the details in the proof work just the same. It turns out that you still have an equivalence relation. The only difference is now the right cosets are the equivalence classes. So this is shortcutting a lot of details, but it's saying it's the same story, just you get slightly dyslexic and left becomes right. So if two left cosets are equal, that means that G1 inverse G2 is an H. But you can replace G2 with its double inverse like this. And by this definition, that means that G1 inverse is related to G2 inverse with respect to this equivalence relation. By definition, that means they have the same equivalence class with this equivalence relation, and that means that these two equivalence classes are the same. So these two cosets are the same. And then you go backwards the same way. So if they're the same coset, that means these two are equivalent under this equivalence relation. That means this is true, which means this is true, which means that is true. So all these statements are if and only if. This is called proof by cheating, because I'm just proving the equivalent right-handed version of the result and then just doing this. The more difficult approach would actually be doing the direct proof. However, I don't find the direct proof to be that enlightening, so I'm not going to give it this time. I mean, the only really significant detail about this part is that when you have the same left cosets, you do not have the same right cosets. You have to add in this inversion factor as well.